We've looked at the question of the image and likeness of God inside of us, and then the last <laughs> session we looked at the struggles. The struggle that um, uh, this causes us, it's, the, it's the, really the root of our greatness, but it's also the root of our struggles. So in this last session, I want to talk a little bit about um, how to live with that healthily. How do we cope with these energies? How do we channel them correctly? How do we put them under the right disciplines? Because as you know, the word discipleship comes from the root discipline. To be a disciple is to put yourself under a discipline. To be a disciple of Christ is to put yourself under a Christian discipline. What are the right disciplines to channel our energies so, so that we precisely walk that line between depression and inflation? So I've entitled this last section simply Living Healthily Within the Divine Madness. How do you live healthily within the divine madness? The divine madness is not negotiable. You know, we don't have a, a, a choice of turning a power switch and not, so we're going to be living inside of this, and we're either going to live with depression or inflation. We're either going to live healthily or unhealthily. Um, how do we do this? What are the correct disciplines? And um, I've given 10, since Moses gave 10 commandments, I think we should have 10. Okay. <laughs> So really, 10 commandments for the long haul, 10 commandments to, to channel and discipline our energies creatively. The first one, simply pray. And make sure that you are touching energy, but not identifying with it. And pray as well inside the flames. Um, what am I saying here? This is going to be more of a summary of things I've already said. Remember when I told you a story about Robert Moore? And he, he began his talk, he says, if you're over 25 and you're in this room listening to this talk, you probably live with a lot of depression. Why? Because you're a sensitive person and you don't want to live with a lot of inflation. But we're living with one or the other. Okay, and m most sensitive people are so afraid of acting out, of not being a good person, of being an egotist, that we'd much sooner live with depression and all it brings us than to live with inflation and how that hurts other people. But the trick... The rule, of course, is we want to live in neither. And the trick there is easy to name, hard to do. The trick, of course, is that we need to constantly access those energies. You need to be in touch with the goddess, with the god inside of you. If we aren't in touch, we're going to be depressed. If we've somehow suppressed those energies, uh, if we're not ego enough, if we're not touching the, the deep energies enough, we're going to be depressed. If we're touching them in the wrong way or identifying with them, we're going to be full of ourselves and people won't be able to stand us and we're going to be hurting people. But we want to, we, we want to touch them without identifying with them. So how do you do that? Why don't we give you an image, first of an image, and it's an image of Christian prayer or all good prayer. Have you ever seen on television how they fuel up little fighter jet planes in the sky? They can fuel up a plane in the sky, but this little plane, which is running out of gas, has to come up to this mother plane. It's called the mother plane, which is this huge gas tank, literally, flying. And it has to get close enough so that there can be a nozzle coming from the mother plane to the little plane. And then it draws fuel from the mother plane, and it continues to fly. But it's tricky. If it doesn't get close enough, it can't fuel up. It'll eventually run out of gas. But if it ever bumps the mother plane and runs into it, everything goes up in a ball of fire. That's kind of an image for us in God, <laughs> you know, with this divine energy. We always have to be touching this energy. If we're not touching it, we get depressed. We run out of gas. And, no, 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 who am I? Life is tough, you know. Um, or would say, how are you doing? Say, so you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> or we used to have a philosophy professor. We'd come up to him and say, good morning, Father. He'd say, we say good morning. Said, is it? Is it a good morning? <laughs> See, and so we live with a chronic depression. We live with a lot of people who are depressed. See, and that's we're out of touch with our energy. And usually we're sensitive, and they're sensitive. So we need to touch that energy, but at the same time we may not identify with it. If we identify with it, we go up in a, in, in a cloud of smoke. We we implode um, the ball of fire. You know, there's um, another way of putting this. Um, I sometimes talk about this in terms of the soul. You know, your soul, Thomas Aquinas once said, the soul is the substantial form of the body. That's actually philosophically brilliant. You know, your soul, what is your soul? Well, your soul isn't some invisible piece of tissue paper floating around inside of you, you know. 
Your soul is precisely your energy and so on. Now, but this has to do two things. A, a healthy soul does two things for you, okay? A healthy soul is your principle of energy, and at the same time, a healthy soul is also your principle of integration. And it's, it's, it's interesting. You can see this physically. Uh, now, this is going to sound kind of, kind of raw and primal, but it's true. But if you've ever watched a person die, if you've ever been in a room when a person's died, you can tell the exact minute when the soul leaves the body. Not that you see something, but uh, in this sense. See, up until that moment, there's energy inside of this body. Maybe even though the person's sick or whatever, but there's some kind of, there's energy inside of the body. The second the soul leaves the body, it's inert. There's no more energy. You know the soul has left the body. The soul is the principle of energy. Okay? And at the same time, the soul is also the principle of integration. So that right now, our bodies are made up of all kinds of chemicals and things, but everything's working together. Something is keeping them all together. It's the same in all living beings. That's why Thomas Aquinas says, even trees have a soul. Animals have a soul. They may not have an immortal soul. They have a soul because they work together. There's a principle of integration. So your soul has to keep you on fire, and your soul has to keep you glued together, and those are oftentimes working in opposites. That um, what, what makes you, gives you fire sometimes gets you unglued. So quite simply, I want to give you an expression from Jesus. Jesus said, what does it profit a person if you gain the whole world and suffer the loss of your own soul? Well, we always think that what he's saying is, you know, what does it profit you if you become a millionaire and become rich and famous and gain the whole world, but you've sold your soul to the devil and you die and go to hell? Well, he means that too, but he means something much more primitive first. You know, there's many ways you can lose your soul, and, and in, uh, I mean, not in complete ways, but as an example, and two different ways. Imagine you're in depression where you don't have really a principle for energy. You're, you're, you're just lying and saying, I don't know why, I don't know why I want to get up this morning. You know, my life is meaningless, I don't know why I'm living with these people and so on. See, that's depression. That's a loss of soul. There's no fire. We're dying inside. It's depression. But conversely, you can be looking in the mirror and you can be full of energy and say, I don't even know who I am anymore. I was once this farm kid, I grew up and I don't know, who, who am I? See, we're becoming unglued. We used that expression. I've become unglued. Okay. See, your soul has to glue you together and it has to keep you on fire at the same time. And oftentimes those are competitive things inside of us. You know, and we, uh, we struggle. We struggle to get that balance. So that sometimes I'm really glued together but I'm petrifying inside. Or sometimes I'm full of energy, but I'm falling apart. And see, a good spirituality, a good life of prayer, is always geared to do both. It's geared to keep you on fire, you're touching the fire, you're touching the energy, and it's geared to keep you glued together, you're using the energy safely, you're not disintegrating, you're not falling apart. That, that's, in, in, in a wide sense, that's the function of a good prayer life. That's exactly what prayer is meant to do to you. Now, if I don't pray at all, it's not going to happen. Or if I pray in the wrong ways, cultish-wise and, you know, the way cults work and stuff, it's, they get you on fire, but uh, you burn up. So a good prayer life is precisely, it, it connects you to that energy and then disassociates you at the same time. It tells you the energy of God has to well up inside of me. And I can do great things, but it's not me. It's God acting inside of me. This is not about me. It's about something else, you know. So when you look at the examples I used this morning, Mother Teresa, John Paul, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, these were great people, and they had great energy, but it wasn't about themselves. Mother Teresa was never about Mother Teresa. She was about God and the world and the poor and so on. So notice they, they, they channeled, and, and in many ways just they incarnated great energy, but they didn't identify with it. In fact, they were always the first person people to say, this is not about me, it's not about me, this is about somebody else. The same with Jesus. Remember, Jesus says, I don't do a single thing of myself. Nothing I do is my own. Everything comes from the Father. Now, if great artists could also do that, say, you know, I do great art, but it's not me. This is not about me. Great athletes, I do great athletic things, but this is not about me. This is about something else. You know, see, then that's health. But that is our struggle. You know, I used artists and athletes as kind of prime analogates of this, but we all struggle with that in some way. It's, 
And then, and, and the way we experience it always depression, inflation, you know, where we bounce back and forth. I'm too full of it, or I'm too empty of it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm dying inside, I'm petrifying, or I'm acting out in bad ways, and I'm full of myself. Uh, actually, when we say the expression, I'm full of myself, I'm not really full of myself, I'm full of divine energy, except I'm calling it my energy. See, that's, that's inflation. The energy is real, and the energy is divine, the energy is godly. So if she's full of herself. No, she's full of God, but she's, she thinks it's her. Okay. Mother Teresa was also full of it, except she was full of God, but she was clear it wasn't her. So that's what a great prayer life will do for you. Okay. And, you know, there's, there's no stronger way I can put it. We need to pray, not because God needs our prayers, because if we don't pray, we're simply going to bounce between inflation and depression, depression, inflation, um, will either be falling apart or will be dying inside, one or the other, all the time. Then I say, pray to inside the flames. A little, Im little image there, um, which I steal from the book of Daniel, which is one of my favorite books. In fact, on nights when you've watched the 6 o'clock news, news and you get really depressed, um, why? Because you see all this stuff in the world and you can't seem to do anything about it. Go and read the book of Daniel and you'll realize we've been there before. Remember Daniel says this great prayer, he says, Lord, he says, in our day we have no leader, no prophet, no, no king, no priest, no first fruits. We don't even have a language we can agree on. How are we ever going to clear up this mess? Sounds like us after we've watched the news. <laughs> Who's going to take care of all of this and so on? Okay. But then the, 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 this powerful image in the book of Daniel. Daniel writes the story and it seems like it, the whole world apostatized. So Daniel gives that the whole world just went crazy. Okay, except for three young men, and they decided they would worship the true God. This is a powerful image. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, I even like the name, that's archetypally bad. You, you know there's going to be a bad man if he's called Nebuchadnezzar and he's a king. You know? So he decides these three young men are going to apostatize or he's going to kill them. So he brings them and he asks them to apostatize and they won't. So he said he became enraged and he told his people, he said, stoke up the furnaces to burn people, he said, and make the flame seven times hotter than usual. So they were going to get burnt, but not just a little, they were really going to get it. So they get these flames seven times normal temperature, and he pitches these three young men into, into the furnace, and then they close the door, and they wait, and they open them up, and the three young men are walking around safely inside the flames, because they were singing sacred songs. And while they were singing sacred songs, the flames had no power to touch them. Flames which were seven times the normal temperature. Okay, that's a beautiful image of prayer and many other things. Um, before when I talked about, you know, getting, you know, stimulated and overstimulated in our grandiosity. See, today we are. We walk around in our culture oftentimes in flames that are seven times the normal temperature. You know, it's not easy walking around in our culture and keeping balance. You know, we, we, we walk in a culture that's satiated with many things, not necessarily bad things, but divine energy that's been overstimulated. Sex, it's a divine energy, but it's overstimulated in our culture. You know, possession, greed, jealousy, all the things, anger, rage, and so we, we walk around the world, this is a pretty highly charged planet. So when you go home today, you're walking into flames seven times their normal <laughs> temperature. Uh, but you can keep your balance there. You can keep your balance there, but you got to be singing sacred songs inside of the flames. You get the idea if these young men ever stop singing those songs, they get scorched in a hurry, you know, and that's true for us in our culture. If you stop praying our culture, the culture is going to swallow you. Um, not that it's a bad culture, it's just a hot culture. And particularly, that's why I used this image, it's stimulating us in our grandiosity. You know, that's why we're so restless. That's why it's so hard to come to rest because in, in our culture, um, this isn't abstract. You know, we raise young kids today, I feel sorry for them, you know. We raise them and we give them the expectation, you can have it all. You know, the little boy or the little girl, you can grow up and you're going to have a perfect body and perfect friends and a perfect marriage and a perfect everything. And, you know, you're going to all look like Julie Roberts and Brad Pitt. And you're going to have wonderful marriage partners and live in great houses and so on. And we can't deliver on that, you know. See, and, and, and you're going to be creative and you're going to be a writer and an athlete and an artist and a rock star and American Idol and all the things wrapped together and have your own talk show besides. <laughs> okay. And see, so we get, what, what's that doing? That's stimulating them in their grandiosity. Like, I, you know, 
it makes you feel like I can, I can taste the whole world. And then we can't deliver on it. You know how different my parents' generation, they grew up saying this prayer, prayer every day. Notice how different this prayer is. For now we mourn, weeping in this valley of tears. Well, that may sound a little morbid, but I'll tell you what, it gave them symbolic permission to, to um, accept life. They knew what to do when, they, when, when, when the inadequacies of life hit them. They had the symbolic tools. They had the keyboard to play the song. Our kids today, they don't have the keyboard to play that song. And when frustration hits, they're not equipped for it. We just haven't equipped them to handle frustration and just the, and at the same time as we're overstimulating their grandiosity. We say, you can have it all. You are all. You are everything. And partly that's true. Don't get me wrong. That's true. Um, and they're going to have a lot of depression or a lot of inflation in their lives. And so do we see prayer, praying inside the flames. Secondly, to keep our eyes turned upward, always connecting ourselves to our source. Um, you know, we have a god or a goddess inside of us. And for that reason, it's pretty important that our horizons be pretty big. And I want to use an image. It's an artistic image, and it's a script image. It's really beautiful. And it's the image of St. Stephen being stoned in Scripture. And sometimes artists really capture that well. Have you ever seen you know, artistic renderings of Stephen being stoned to death? But the way it's described in the Acts of the Apostles, they said, the crowd, and in Scripture, the, the word crowd, when you have the word crowd in the New Testament, you can always add the word mindless. The, the adjective doesn't have to be supplied, it's, it's implied. Crowds are mindless. They crucify people, they, they adulate people, crowds just act out, okay? So the crowd is, cru is, is stoning Stephen. They say, and the crowd rushed in, looking at Stephen, their eyes intent on Stephen, throwing stones, but Stephen's eyes were looking upward. Notice that that's a powerful image. If you want to miss that, it's a powerful mystical image of, of how we should be in the world. See, the crowd, the reason why they're mindless and the reason why they're killing somebody they don't even know, which we often do, you know, is because their eyes are looking, their eyes were intent on Stephen, okay? Stephen's eyes were intent this way. You just get it visually. See, Stephen's eyes weren't looking throughout. He was looking towards heaven. And because of that, he's grounded in a reality that they're not grounded in. See, when we're looking only at each other, we're only looking at the world, we're only, see, then um, our grandiosity, our godliness has no place to go. You get the image? Stephen is looking this way. His eyes are looking towards heaven. And because of that, he's got the right perspective. He, he, can, he can handle because he's grounded in the right way. We ground ourselves precisely by looking at an infinite horizon. He's seeing the big picture. They're seeing only around. I was just at a conference recently, and a very good one, on, on uh, missiology. We had it at our school, and we had theologians from around North America, and we had a young French-Canadian theologian, Pierre-Olivier Tremblay. I thought, what a nice name for a theologian. Bright young fellow. At one point, he said, you know, he said, I work uh, with young kids in Quebec young, you know, young adults and so on. He says, you know what their problem is? He said, they don't have any hope. They don't have any hope. He said, you know, they have good lives and, you know, they're happy and they socialize and celebrate. He said, but they don't have any hope. He said, why? He said, because they have no distant vision. And then they only think about today. You can only think about today. And he said, because of that, they get discouraged. They go up and down real easily. Notice it's just a different language of what I'm talking about. See, they don't, they don't have a long-range vision. In fact, he used the word, he said, they don't have a meta-narrative. They don't have a, meta-narrative is beautiful, they don't have a, a big picture. See, when we were little kids growing up on the Baltimore Catechism, whatever your church was, whatever else, we had a big picture. Remember the Baltimore Catechism? First question, who made you? God made you. But the second question, why did God make you? To know, love, and serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. See, that's a meta-narrative, you know? See, and then you could weep in a valley of tears and yet good days and bad days, but you, you, you have your eyes on some bigger picture, some bigger horizon. Now, I don't know if we realize that unconsciously that horizon has just shrunk, shrunk, and shrunk. And our kids and our nephews and nieces, they're good people. We weren't always able to give them that horizon. And so their horizon isn't much bigger than who won's going to win the World Series, who's, who won Survivor this week, American Idol. Uh, see, and those are 
all good things, but it's all here. Our eyes are turned, and then we end up crucifying each other. You know, Luke wrote that text. It's a work of genius. When our eyes are focused on each other, sooner or later we're going to kill each other. We're going to stone each other. But if your eyes are focused up, if your horizon's different, you're grounded in a different way. See, it's a little bit like the first point, but, um, but to live our grandiosity and to not become overly depressed or overly inflated, we need an horizon. We need to connect the God inside of us to the God who's outside of us. So that our eyes, I just love that image from, from Luke where St. Stephen, Stephen's eyes were fixed upward. And sometimes artists, they get that wonderfully. Stephen's looking this way. They're lo all looking at him. And that's why they're trying to kill him. When we just look at each other, sooner or later, we try to kill each other. That isn't abstract. You know, remember what we do with our celebrities? We do it. Just, it's all cultures. We, 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 we adulate our celebrities and their gods and goddesses, and then we crucify them, every one of them. We're just waiting for them to fall. And how bad can Paris Hilton's life get, or it's Britney Spears, or somebody fall from Greece? And we love it. See, we love adulating them, and we love knocking them down, you know. When we turn our eyes towards each other, sooner or later we'll also kill each other. Scripture says, keep your eyes, that's a metaphor, it's an image. Keep them heavenward. Stretch them towards a bigger horizon. Thirdly, keep grounded inside of family, community, and church, remaining inside of schools of charity that keep us defantasized, grounded, and sane. Okay, this is an important rule. Uh, see, to do this, you can't do this on your own. You know how we keep ourselves from being too depressed or too inflated? Just make sure you stay with family, community, and church. They'll do it to you, you know, both good and bad. Story and a good one. Some years ago when I was living in Toronto, Mordecai Richler, who was a famous Jewish writer and a very good novelist, I was living in Montreal, he was already in his, I think in his 70s, and he came to the University of Toronto to talk to young writers. And he gave a wonderful talk about creativity and so on. But afterwards there was a question period and someone said to him, they said, uh, Mr. Richler, he said, How, I know you get many invitations to speak at places. Why did you take this one? Why did you accept to come today? Richler laughed and said, said, do you want the BS answer or the real answer? He said, I'll give you the BS answer first. He said, my, my, my BS answer for that is, said, I'd like to tell you that because I'm dedicated to young writers and I'm really interested in you getting a career and I'm trying to help. He said, partly that's true. He said, partly that's true. He said, but that's not the real reason. Do you know why I took this? engagement is two of my growing kids and my grandkids live here and it was a free trip to Toronto. That's why I took it. <laughs> he said, I'm, no, no, otherwise I wouldn't have taken this. This is a free trip to visit family, to spend time with my kids and grandkids. And he says, like, why shouldn't I take this? <laughs> you, you were just the excuse for that, you know? <laughs> but he said, but let me talk about this. He said, I'm glad you brought this up because that was going to be my last point. He said, you're all aspiring to be writers and artists and so on. He said, and you're going to be moving through academia and other places in the artistic community and so on. He said, where they're going to send you a dangerous signal. And they're going to send you precisely the signal that this is all more important than family and more important than your churches and more important than the communities. And it's not. And it's not. He said, so this is my, my, my little axiom to you. He said, you want a kernel of wisdom, I'll give it to you. He said, you don't have to be a jerk to be a writer. So don't become one. He said, if you don't stay close to family, and to community and to your churches, you will. So there's a lot of brilliant writers who are jerks. He said, you know, but you don't have to. And said, so they're going to give you the impression you need to do that to become a good writer or a good artist. You don't. And he says, my whole life and my whole writing career has been anchored by my wife and my kids. He said, they've kept me sane and they've kept me humble and they've kept me human and so on. He said, and I wouldn't be that without them. He said, you need that. You need family, you need community, he says, to keep you grounded. To keep you grounded precisely in your art. He said, now they, they can't tie you down so that you can't do it. He said, but, but don't move away. He said, inside of the artistic community, they're going to give you that impression, you know. And a lot of artists, you know, have a struggle with family, with community, with churches. He said, but stay close to them. Stay close to them for your sake, not just for the sake of art. Stay close to them. He said, you don't have to be a jerk to be a writer. But most people will tell you that. If you haven't read Kathleen Norris, read her. She kind of alternates between very, very good spiritual books, which are written as spiritual books, Dakota, 
Amazing Grace, The Cloister Walk, and then autobiographical books, which are also deep spiritual books. You know, she's just finishing one which is being released this summer called The Cydia on the Noonday Devil. It's called A Writer, A Marriage, and a Monastery. A brilliant book. But three or four years ago, she wrote a book called The Virgin of Bimington, which is about her college years and her becoming a writer and eventually moving to the CODIS and so on. But in there, she has some brilliant chapters about moving through kind of writing and artistic circles in New York, really sophisticated and so on, and all the temptations there precisely to lose yourself beyond family, church, Christian morality, community, and so on, and how she was saved, in many ways saved, by this woman called Betty Cray, who was a great writer, who just took her under her wing and told her what Mordecai Richler basically told the students in Toronto. You don't have to be a jerk and an idiot to do this. Don't fall into this. Become a good person. Ground yourself. Stay with family. Stay with churches. Become sane. Because those, those things, those agencies alone are going to keep you grounded. So that um, the major role, you know, number three, how do you carry this energy properly? Well, alone, it's dangerous. Make sure you have family close to you. Make sure you stay close to somebody. Stay with community, not just family communities, but good friendships and so on. And not just Job's friends. Don't surround yourself with friends who just admire you and tell you how wonderful you are because that, that those are false friends. Okay, And stay close to a church. Stay inside of some ecclesial community which can ground you um, because what, those, what they do is to keep you sane. Um, they keep you grounded. They, they, they defantasize you. You know, today, let me give one of my pet peeve things on this. And I know so many sincere people are into that, where they want spirituality without religion, you've heard they know. Spirituality without a church. So they say, you know, I, 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 I'm a spiritual person, but I don't want to be associated with an ecclesial community. And oftentimes, that's a very sincere search. But it's also a dangerous one. You know why? Because when we don't commit ourselves to a community, and commit ourselves to a community doesn't mean we just drop in on our own terms. You make a commitment to stay there. You know, we have nothing to defantasize us, which means after a while, I can become weird as hell. Who's going to tell me that? You know, I'm getting ever more weird, but I stay away from people long enough that, you know, I, I live in this illusion that I'm a nice guy and I'm spiritual. Uh, nobody can stand me. Well, you hang around a church or a family very long, they'll tell you pretty quickly. <laughs> you know, and they'll dispel your illusion, your fantasy real quick. Now, sometimes the downside of that is you know, families and communities are great. They will not let you fall through the floor. The danger is they also won't let you grow through the ceiling. So that uh, they'll defantasize you, but they'll also at times cut you down more than you should be cut down. Who do you think you are? You think you can write a book? We know who you are. You're just Martha. Stay in your place. See, so they can also overdo it, but and you have to factor that in. But the families, communities, churches, they are the number one defantasizing things on the planet. You will not live an illusion very long inside of a family or inside of a church. Um, and uh, sometimes you won't live a good dream very long there either, but you have to be able to, to know when to say, no, here I need to stake out, but also that, but stay with family. I just like the way Mordecai Richler put this. You don't have to be a jerk to be creative. And the way you're going to save yourself from being a jerk is stay close to family church community. Because uh, they'll tell you, whenever you're acting out and inflated, they'll let you know in a hurry. Uh, and without them, you'll, you're going to act out pretty quick. Or you're going to fall into depression. Uh, see, the family will also stop you from becoming too depressed. Um, now, the, up, the downside is they'll also stop you from growing too much. Fourth, put yourself under obedience so as to live beyond the ego with its needs, its wounds, its indignations, and its inflations. Be a knight, not a hero. Okay. See, our ego, as I talked about this morning, our ego isn't a bad thing. And it's a necessary thing and so on. But the problem is your ego um, can knock you all around the planet too. See, your ego has many wounds. It has pride. It's had wounds. It's, that's where I say, well, I, I come from a dysfunctional family and I was hurt and this happened to me and so on. Or I simply can't in endure this insult, or I can't put up with this, or I can't talk to my sister again, or this 
person said this in church, I'll never go to church again. Those things are real, but that's your ego speaking. That's your ego speaking. It's not you. That's not the deepest part of you. That's your ego speaking. But your ego has pride and it has wounds and it, it has indignations and so on. Now, the ego has to be under somebody. You know, Simone Weil, if you know who she was, the wonderful, one of the great women produced in the last century, and not a woman who would say this easily, you know, because she was the first original feminist. She's the first woman to become a doctor at the University of Paris and so on. She paved a lot of places uh, for women to go, and she was hardly anybody's subservient person, you know. But she, she was a, a great mind and a great person. And at a certain point, she'd always be clear on that. She, somebody once asked her, they said, now imagine this, the most independent woman you could ever meet. And someone says to her, what are you looking for in life? What are you searching for? And Simone said, I'm searching for what everybody is ultimately searching for. She said, I'm searching for somebody to be obedient to, for something to put myself under. She said, because without obedience, we inflate and we grow silly and pompous even to ourselves. You know, I'm searching for somebody to be obedient to. It's Jesus. I do nothing of myself. See, Jesus put himself under the Father. I always act under the Father's will. It's very, very important that we put ourselves under something, somebody, and pick that carefully. You know, Christianity, Christ, God, whatever, um, and be the knight, not the hero. You know, if you've, ever, if you've ever studied archetypes, and if you haven't studied archetypes, you can study them really easy. Just rent some King Arthur legend movies, recently, and they do this well. But notice a knight, the knights of the round table. The knight never did his own thing. A knight begins by going and genuflecting and laying his sword at the foot of the king. He said, now you give me the agenda. I execute the agenda, but it's not my agenda. You know How different that is from our hero movies of Sylvester Stallone, Bruce Willis, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, where they become the hero. They are the agenda, you know, and we look at, that's the great hero. See, a hero, archetypally, is always a dangerous fellow. You don't want to be a hero. You want to be a knight. You want to be somebody that, notice Jesus was never a hero. Jesus was a knight. He came and he genuflected, put his sword at the foot of somebody else, the Father. He says, it's not my agenda, that's your agenda. And then he serves. You know, the hero goes out and says, I know better and I know how this world should be run and I'm going to do it. That's the hero of our, of our contemporary, you know, uh, epics. Stallone, Bruce Willis, Schwarzenegger. Notice they're always, there's somebody who's a huge hero and ultimately the agenda is his. Usually it's a his, but now lately we're having some women epic heroes too and so on. We have the women Bruce Willis is now and so on. But see, they're the hero. They're not the knight. That's not scriptural. And oftentimes that can be the biggest ego and depressing trip of all. Notice how clear Jesus is. This is not about me. This is not my agenda. You know, I work under the Father. Incidentally, there's you know, a great text which is easy to miss. And that is the, the dialogue between Jesus and the centurion. Remember the centurion is a Roman officer. And they say one day this Roman officer, his son was sick, his servant. And so he comes to Jesus and he said, my servant is sick and heal him but don't come to my house. Remember that's the famous text, O Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the words, my son shall be healed. We change it to my soul before communion. Okay. And, and, and then he says, you don't have to come. If you say the word, he'll be healed, but it's going to be stunning what he says next. And Jesus recognizes that. Jesus says, in all of Israel, nobody's got this. You've got it. Okay. He said to Jesus, you know why you don't have to come? He said, because I recognize how authority works. And you work with great authority. He said, I recognize how authority works. How does it work? He's an officer. He says, I'm an officer in the Roman army. When I say to a man, go, he goes. If I say, stay, he stays. Not because I'm powerful, because I'm under Caesar. And he's not dealing with me. He's dealing with the entire Roman army. And he says, I'm a powerful man as an officer. Not because I'm personally powerful, because I'm under Caesar and the whole Roman army. Okay. And he said, I recognize that you have that kind of power because it's not coming from you. You're under somebody. See, he recognized that the power that was coming in Jesus wasn't coming from him. He said, I recognize how authority works, and I recognize you're really powerful because your authority is like mine. It's not coming from you. It's coming from who you're under. 
And Jesus says, in all of Israel, among all the people of 1,800 1800 years of religious training, nobody has understood it as clearly as you, who didn't do an RCA at all. (laughs) This man skipped the RCA program and he got it. And he said, among the RCA people, nobody got this. You know, oftentimes when Jesus says that about the Syrophoenician woman, about the Roman soldier, see, these were non-Jews. They had skipped the whole catechetical process. That's why I said, in all of Israel, I haven't seen faith like yours. It means, you know, among all those who took the catechetical program for the last 1,800 years, you know, they're supposed to have gotten it, and they don't get it, but you got it. See, and what did, what did this man get? He got the way God, why Jesus was powerful, because it wasn't coming from him. See, he was channeling somebody else's power. It wasn't his power. It was the Father's power. You know, why was Mother Teresa, this frail little woman, so powerful? She was a powerful woman because it wasn't coming from her, you know. Alone, she was this frail little woman, four foot ten or whatever, you know, four foot nothing, you know. But she was under somebody, and that made her a very powerful person. And people recognized that. This is a powerful woman because she, you know, she's genuflected somebody. Mother Teresa was a knight. She wasn't a hero. John Paul II was a knight. He wasn't a hero, you know. Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, they were knights, they weren't heroes, you know. Um, that's what we need to be. See, then, then the energy, you, you, you can really release your energy because it's not your energy and it's under somebody, it's under a discipline. That's what the word disciple means. The disciple says you're under a discipline. Uh, you, you have yourself disciplined. Fifth, become post-sophisticated. Go back to that time before hardness of heart. You know the text in scripture where they come up and ask Jesus about divorce? Now, I'll tell you something, he's not going to say a lot about divorce. <laughs> Jesus is not going to answer this question about divorce. He's going to answer something about a hundred times deeper than divorce. They come up to Jesus, and actually it's a trick question. They say it's a trick question. They were trying to trick Jesus. They come up and says, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife under any pretext? Okay, And why that's a trick question is because they were Pharisees, and there were two schools of thought, a liberal school and a conservative school. And the liberal school was that you could divorce your wife for any reason, and the conservative school is you could only divorce her for adultery. Okay? And they wanted Jesus to pronounce between the two, because then either way he's going to be in trouble with a group. You know, They're divided kind of 50-50, so he's going to side with the conservatives or liberals, and the other side's not going to like him. So they come up to Jesus and said, what do you say? Is it lawful to divorce your wife, wife for any pretext whatsoever? So are you a liberal or conservative on this? Well, Jesus um, always asks, answers a question with another question. He said, what did Moses say? I mean, there's, there's an old line, they said, to, uh, this Irishman, someone came up to this Irishman and said, is it true if you ask an Irish person a question, they always answer with another question? He said, who told you that? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, Jesus is like that, okay. They come up and they ask him this. So Jesus says, what does Moses say? Okay. So he turns the question back to him. Well, Moses actually was with the stricter school. Moses said you could divorce her on grounds of porneia, which we suspect means adultery. Okay. Then Jesus said to them, well, Moses said that because of your hardness of heart. But in the beginning, it wasn't like that. He said in the beginning, a man would cling to his wife and the two would become flesh like in Genesis. He says, they didn't think of divorce. And then he turns, and he's always a child there when he needs one. He turned and he picked up a child and he says, uh, and look at this child, to such as these is given the kingdom. Whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. Where, you know, whoever rejects the child rejects me. Now what has any of that got to do with divorce? Okay. <laughs> they come to say, is, is it lawful to divorce for strict reason or, or no reason? You know? So what does Moses say? Well, Moses said you could do it for grounds of adultery. Jesus said, Moses said that because of your hardness of heart. That's not an answer. He just said that to you because that's the only answer you could hear. But in the beginning, now the beginning is a technical word. That means before original sin, before sin entered the world. See, in the beginning, the man and woman were in the garden. They were naked and didn't know it. Now he said before sin, nobody thought of divorce. It wasn't even an issue. You know, they clung to each other and the man and wife were faithful to each other. It says, and little kids don't think about it either because their heart is still soft. It's after we sin and after we get wounded that our hearts, and we get sophisticated, our hearts start hardening, and then all kinds of things come up, including divorce. Notice he's not really talking much about divorce. He's talking about something much deeper. He says in the right context, the question of divorce doesn't pose itself. 
like little kids who want to marry their mom and their dad and everybody and so on. See, their hearts haven't hardened yet. And in the beginning, before there was sin in the world, people didn't think of divorce. So it's an invitation. He says, we got to go back always. We got to try to go back in our hearts that time before, before that time that you got hurt. You know, kids are innocent. But you know what the word innocent means? The word innocent means not wounded. That's literally what the word innocent means. Kids have not yet been wounded. Once we get wounded, we start getting... What happens when you get a wound? You have to get a callus on. You have to have something to protect you from the rawness of the pain. So little kids aren't wounded yet. They don't think of divorce. We only think of a divorce because we've been wounded. Our innocence has been taken away. And your innocence isn't taken away, first of all, sexually. Your innocence is taken away when you get wounded. Every time you get wounded, you become less innocent because you've got to protect yourself. And our hearts have to harden to protect themselves. And Jesus said the struggle of life is always go, go back. Go back before that. Try to recover that child. Try to go back to that time in the beginning before you were hurt. Find those times and go back there. And then when you're standing there, you can answer the question of divorce. Um, you know, Moses said, since you're all wounded and our world is the way it is, there's going to be divorce. You can say that today. You know, in a world like ours, there's going to be divorce. It's not the way God intended it, but that's going to happen in our world because we're all wounded. Um, so try to go back. Try to go back. See, that's um, that time before you were hurt. Go back to the beginning. That's what the word beginning means. Sixth, put your fire at the service of community, the rules for initiation. Initiation rites are meant to teach five things. First of all, life is hard. The first thing they teach the kid is life is hard. Now up to now you've been a kid and you've got a chance to play and so on. Now you're becoming an adult and for an adult, life is hard. Okay, you're gonna have to suffer and it's not gonna, it's the, that's the first one. Secondly, very importantly, mortality said you're gonna die. Someday you're gonna die. See, as a kid, it's timeless. As a kid, yeah, you don't even want to take kids to funerals and so on. They, you know, they see, but they teach you life is hard. Secondly, you're gonna die. Thirdly, get ready for this one. You're not that important. <laughs> okay, life is hard. You're gonna die, and you're not that important. There's six billion people exactly like you. You know, now you think you're the center of the earth, and inside of your life, you are the center of the earth, and that's okay but you're part of 6.5 billion who are the same, you're one of 6.5 billion. You're not that important. Fourthly, you're not in control. You know, you're not in control of your life. And you better trust community, you better trust larger, you better trust your family, you're not in control. And I like the last and the best of all, your life is not about you. You think your life is about you, but it's not. You're here to do service, to help, you know, you may have to, you know, you, you have to sacrifice yourself for your family, for your community, and so on. And when your mother gets sick and you happen to be the dutiful daughter living five miles away, you're going to have to visit her every day for the rest of your life because it's not about you. It's about your mother now. Now, if you put those five rules together, uh, first of all, we can healthily teach ourselves, but also with our kids uh, and our society. See, they will help us to discipline those energies. It's going to be hard. You know, when my parents said that prayer every day, for now we live mourning and weeping in this valley of tears, they were alerting themselves to that. They were trying to teach it to us. You know, it's going to be hard out there sometimes. It's not always going to be Walt Disney and Hallmark cards. It's going to be tough, and you're going to die, and you're going to have to suffer, and uh, it's not about you. My life is given for me to put at service of somebody else. You know, that's going to be the greatest antidote to depression and inflation that you're going to find. You know. If you want to find the road to walk between depression and inflation, put your life at the service of community. You know, take these five rules, you won't be depressed a lot, and you won't be inflated a lot either. Okay. Let your energies fire you towards a different kind of glory. Now I bring this up because glory is a big thing, you know, inside of our fantasy, and you can't help that. Inside of our fantasy, inside of our narcissism, inside of our grandiosity, you are the star. You know, uh, in your daydreams, you don't play second fiddle. You play lead. <laughs> you know, and don't even apologize about that. You can't be otherwise. See, inside of you, you are this special person. You can't deny it, okay? And so what we want, glory. 
See, in, in our fantasy, and don't even apologize about that, in our fantasy daydreams, we want glory, okay? Now, hang on to that, but just define glory the way Jesus is going to define it. Let me give you a powerful text from Scripture. One day, the two disciples, James and John, they come up to Jesus. In fact, they do this twice. One time, they bring their mother along to do the ask, okay? <laughs> and they come up to Jesus, and notice this question is not very high at all. They say, when you come into your glory, could you arrange it so we have the seats at your right hand and your left hand? You know, nice humble guys, you know? Because they, they have this idea Jesus is going to be the great king, and it'd be really nice for us to be, you know, one on the right, one on the left. One, one time they bring their mother along, she does the asking. And notice at that point, Jesus takes their question seriously. He doesn't say, didn't you hear my lesson on humility? You know, other times he talked about humility, not at that point. He says, he takes the question seriously, he says, can you drink of the chalice? Can you drink the cup? And by that he means the cup of suffering. Can you drink the cup? And they're young and grandiose, they say, absolutely, bring it on. You know, sound like anybody? But anyway. Um, <laughs> and Jesus, they said, we're ready, bring on the chalice of suffering. Jesus said, well, in fact, you will. You will drink the chalice, because everybody will. You'll get the suffering, but you may not get the glory, because the glory is not mine to give. Now. That's a, that's a deep text, okay? And to get it, you've got to go into the Agni in the garden, you know? Um, what's the drama in the Agni in the garden? Where Jesus, see, Jesus is going to go to the glory of Easter Sunday, okay? But his drama with the Father is, he says, can this cup, chalice, pass from me? Remember Jesus said to him, you drink of the chalice? Well, the other time he mentions the chalice is in, when he's sweating blood on the floor in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says to the Father, can this chalice, Father, let this chalice pass me? I don't want to do this suffering. What Jesus is saying is, is there some way to get to the glory of Easter Sunday without going through the humiliation of Good Friday? Without this suffering, it seems there isn't. What Jesus learns in, the, in, in, in Gethsemane is that there's a necessary connection, that there's only one way to get to Easter Sunday, to both its depth and its glory, and that is by going through this kind of pain and suffering. Now, hang on to that. So you know what makes us deep, which is different than what brings other kinds of glory and stuff into our lives? Pain and humiliation. You know, quite simply, do this. You don't have to answer loud, but if you go into, into your life and ask yourself, and honestly ask yourself, what are all the things that have made me deep? Name the real significant things that have made me deep. You know, in virtually every case, it would be something you'd be ashamed to talk about. Some humiliation. Your body didn't turn out right. You were picked on in the playground. You know, something wrong with you. Your parents were dysfunctional. Um, whatever. You know, something, you were the last person picked for the teams. Um, you were the unpopular duckling, whatever. All those things. Now, those things were very humiliating. You know something? They've made you deep. They've given you depth. Those things, they give you character. They drive you deep. So Jesus is telling the apostles, you know, there's only one way to get deep, and that is to suffering. They said, we're ready. He said, but now, the second thing is, it might not bring you the glory. Why not? This is the rule. Suffering is going to make you deep, and it's the only thing that makes you deep. Except it can make you deep in two ways. You know the old expression where they say, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely? That's true, except the reverse is also true. Powerlessness corrupts. And absolute powerlessness corrupts absolutely. So what happens is suffering makes us deep, but it can make us deep in one of two ways. It can give us two kinds of glory. One of them is suffering can make you deep in the wrong way. So that, for instance, that young guy who shot those kids at Virginia Tech, he had obviously suffered a lot. But it didn't turn him into compassion and understanding and forgiveness. It turned him into a murderer, into bitterness. A lot of Al-Qaeda, a lot of those people, they've suffered a lot, but it hasn't turned them into compassion and depth and stuff. It's made them deep, but it's made them deep in bitterness and anger and, 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 and murder, okay? Whereas with Jesus, he suffered and was humiliated a lot, but what it, it made him deep in compassion. It made him deep in understanding and forgiveness. So what the Bible, the scripture is saying, the real glory is not the glory of winning the Super Bowl, Real glory is not the glory of winning an Oscar. Real glory is not the glory of throwing a no-hitter. 
real glory is not the glory of, you know, selling 30 million books and being Oprah's pick. You know, real glory is not the glory of looking like George Clooney or, or uh, uh, Angelina Jolly. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Real glory is forgiveness, compassion, and understanding. Can you forgive a murderer? Can you forgive somebody who's hurt you? That's the ultimate glory. That is the glory of Easter Sunday. Scholars will point it out to you. know that the resurrection, it is about a physical body coming out of the grave. But spiritually, it's about forgiveness. It's about newness. And the same thing, for instance, you know, we often talk about litmus tests. What is the litmus moral test for a Christian? Well, sometimes people say abortion. Nah, abortion's an important issue. It's not a litmus test. If you want a litmus test for what makes you a Christian morally, there's one test clearly from Jesus. Can you love an enemy and forgive a murderer? That's the test. That's the stretch. That's real glory. Can you love somebody who hates you? Can you understand that person? Can you forgive murderers? Incidentally, John Paul, our last pope, credit to him. We've had popes for 2,000 years, beginning with Peter. He's the first pope who stood up and said, capital punishment's wrong. And the reason why it's always wrong is not because of justice. In fact, injustice, it can be right. Or because we make mistakes, we'll correct the mistake. He said it's wrong because it goes against the center and the heart of the gospel. We're supposed to forgive murderers. That's what Jesus said. Jesus is really clear. Forgive murderers. You don't execute a murderer because he killed somebody. What's Jesus doing when they're, when they're killing him? He says, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. He's not saying, make sure this guy gets the chair. You know, see, that's real glory. And see, so that we need to take our energies, these great energies, and that's also my last point on the bottom there, the 10th, to drive us towards an ever deeper maturity so that what it needs to drive us to is just know, okay, you are a creature made for, bent for, longing for, driven towards glory. But normally we identify that with worldly glory, being the star of winning the Oscar, of you know, being on Oprah, of you know, pitching the no-hitter, of, of being the most beautiful man or woman on the planet, of winning American Idol. See, we spontaneously identify glory there and don't even feel bad. So did James and John. When they said, we'd like the seats of glory at your right hand and left hand, they weren't thinking of compassion and forgiveness. <laughs> they were thinking of no-hitters and Super Bowls and Oprah and so on. And Jesus said, no, no, that's not, but that's not the glory I'm about. And notice that's not the glory the Father gave him. You know, when he's on the cross and he said, if you're the Son of God, come off of the cross. If that would have been Hollywood, he'd have come off the cross and did some serious head knocking immediately. As God, he just died there because that's not what God is about. God isn't about that other kind of power. God is about the power of compassion, understanding, and forgiveness. And see, so ultimately we have to channel this energy so that as we grow older, so I was, what is real glory? What would make you a great woman? What could make you a great man? Not necessarily winning a Super Bowl or writing a book that sells 10 million copies and you get on Oprah and so on. What would make you a great man or woman is can you forgive? Can you live in compassion? Can you live in forgiveness? See, and then that'll also still our hearts. Then we won't be depressed. You know, people who win Super Bowl still get depressed. People who forgive, like Mother Teresa did, they don't get depressed anymore at all, you know, and they don't get inflated either. See, that's real glory. So that, and that's also the glory that lasts forever. It gets us into heaven. It makes us brothers and sisters. It puts us into unity and community and ultimately in ecstasy forever. Uh, so that's, that's what we're shooting for. That's the real maturity we're going for. And that's also ultimately the real glory. That's the glory of the kingdom. And don't feel bad the disciples didn't get that. They needed the Holy Spirit and they need to be crucified themselves before they got it. That in the end, the glory that we're built for, that this, this, this powerful divine energy is for, is not the glory of, you know, getting on the talk show, of being the most glamorous, the most successful person on the planet. It's the glory of forgiveness, compassion, understanding. A heart that's like God's heart. Um, that's what we're shooting for. So these are our energies. They're divine. 
they're problematic, and they're wonderful. And so I wish you a life of really good struggle uh, <laughs> between depression and inflation. Thank you. <laughs>